Perry, Catfish Hunter, Mike Caldwell, Cal Kuntz. These are names of some of the most notable major league pitchers who have called Eastern North Carolina home. But there are many others, including one who attended Campbell before reaching the big leagues in the 1970s. Earl Stevenson grew up in Benson, played baseball at Campbell under legendary coach Hargrove Davis, served his country, and went on to a 13-year pro career. From 1971 through 1979, he spent nearly all of his time either in the majors or at the AAA level. When his playing career ended, Earl made his way back home to Eastern North Carolina, where he has spent the last 25 years involved in coaching youth baseball and helping young people reach their dreams. Later this month, Earl will join the Perry brothers and Coons as an inductee into the Campbell Athletics Hall of Fame. My name is Stan Cole, class of 1987, and this is our next installment of Tales from the Creek, where we visit with people who have made this place special over the years. I'm delighted to be joined today by Campbell alum and former Major League pitcher Earl Stevenson. Welcome to Tales from the Creek, Earl, and thanks for taking time to visit with us. Thank you, Stan, and it's certainly a pleasure. Earl, let's just start at the beginning. How did it all begin? Tell us about what it was like growing up in Johnston County in the 50s and 60s and how you got started in baseball. Oh, I got started uh, probably when I was 10 years old. We we moved around a lot, and uh, my dad was always trying to find a place for uh, to make a little bit more money to take care of the family. And all of it started when I was in uh, – we moved and lived in Raleigh. And uh, my next-door neighbor, uh, a guy same age as I was, asked me if I wanted to play baseball. Well, I'd never played baseball, but I always played with my uncle out in the field, you know. And uh, he said, sure. I said, sure, yes, I'd like to play. He said, well, we, got, we need somebody to play, and uh, how about going with me to the tryout? I said, okay. And... Unbeknownst to me, we had to walk about uh, two or three miles across the, that uh, Dorothea Dix grounds mm-hmm. to get to the uh, field, which is over at Pullen Park. And I uh, got over there and made the team and started playing. And that's where it all started. Were you a pitcher from the beginning? What, uh, um, what positions did you play? Well, the coach put me in center field because I, he told me uh, that because I was left-handed, I was going to play the outfield. So he put me in center field. And I played a little bit at first base. But I never pitched. So growing up, what were some of your favorite teams, your favorite players? Uh, growing up, I would have to say was the uh, Orioles and the Yankees because they were the two teams that you saw a lot on the game of the week mm-hmm. on a Saturday afternoon with Diz and Pee Wee and, and my mother on a Saturday afternoon, God rest her soul, was sitting there, and we'd watch the baseball game. And she, that's how she really introduced me to that, to that, and it just grew from there. Besides school and baseball, um, what else did you do in, during your youth? Do you have any jobs or play other sports? Well, I played uh, basketball in high school all three, all four years. But other than that, I didn't. My, uh, I went to Benson High School, of course, and and uh, the football coach, Mr. Bob Paroli, who's uh, passed away now, uh, tried to get me to play football, and I says, uh, I'll play if my dad will let me. And he went and talked to my dad, and my dad said, no way. He's not going to play because if he breaks that arm, uh, he will not be able to play baseball. So I didn't play. Earl, tell me about when you discovered your talent for pitching. When did you first start pitching? I first started when I was probably 11 or 12. Played a little league in in Garner. Uh, Coach I had up there put me in the pitch, and I started and and just kind of fell in love with it, and it kind of grew from there. But in general, I just loved playing baseball. I didn't care about where I was at Mostly played first base in the outfield, but then pitching kind of grew on me, and I got better and better at it. And and I had a brother that was really an asset to it because he and I always – my brother's a couple years younger than me, and we always played catch in the yard. We, we'd set us up a mound, and he would catch – he would catch me, and I would catch him, and we would 
set up on the inside outside target this work and just kind of helped each other out i'm assuming you didn't have a backstop then so you probably control was probably important right it was and and a lot of people had told me that i had pretty good control being a left-hander but and that's that and we practiced that my brother and i practiced hitting spots and i did have good control in fact uh I had pretty good control all the way up until my first year in the minor leagues. Uh, my pitching coach then was Fred Martin. I was throwing in the bullpen. This is after I'd signed and went with the Cubs and, and spring training. He uh, he said, Earl, have you ever thrown a, a two-seam before? I said, no, Fred, what's that? He said, here, show it. And believe it or not, from that point on, they were through another four-seam fastball. And if you know anything about a two-seam fastball, it moves right and mine moved it had a natural uh downward sink on it and i was never wild but if i was it was low right low in the strike zone earl tell us about uh what drew you to campbell and um and Bowie's creek i uh, uh coach fred mccall offered me a scholarship he was the only – well, I'd been offered a couple others, mm-hmm. but my dad said – and they were very meager. And he said, well, you just can't afford that, Earl. And and so I, I'd been offered to go to Lewisburg and, and to, at the time, Atlanta Christian. And I'd been looking at my other, other schools but never had any offers. And uh, the story that came to me was that uh, Coach McCall told uh, Hoggy that you need to go uh, – take a look at this uh, left-handed pitcher over in Benson. And he did, and uh, come back and told Coach McCall that I uh, would like to have him. And Coach McCall gave me the scholarship, and I didn't, of course, the way things were back then, we needed everything we could get. And he gave, us, he gave me a pretty decent offer. Tell me some of your memories of Coach Davis. Um, I never got to meet him. He had passed on before I, I um, enrolled here at Campbell in the in the early 80s, but I've just heard some great stories about him through the years. What are some of your memories? I don't have a whole lot. I, like I said, I only played for one year. The only thing that I remember <laughs> it jumps out at me is I like to hit, <laughs> and I was a good hitter in, in uh, Little League and, and Pawnee League and high school in American Legion. And uh, we we weren't hitting the ball. We, we just couldn't hit the ball. So I kept after him. I said, Coach, Coach, let me hit. He said, no, no. And finally he put me in one night. And um, there was this big, tall right-hander from uh, Wilmington. Throw pretty hard. I, it's, like I said, it's a long time ago. I don't remember the names or anything, but – I got two hits off of him, and uh, he let me hit a little bit from there on. (laughs) Earl, you left Campbell after one year and later drafted by the Cubs. Tell us about how that came about, how they scouted you, and then they uh, selected you in the old January draft that they used to have. Well, they had looked at me a little bit prior, but I was playing uh, semi-pro baseball in the county, in the Johnston County League and was playing on a team and uh, called Stansel Chapel. And we went to to Rose, Roxburgh playing the state semi-pro tournament. And uh, two years in a row we won it. And I pitched all five games. You had to win. If you were five and oh, you won the thing. And I won 10 games two years. And, and the second year I was – there we went to uh to wichita where he had a national tournament Mm -hmm. and out there i'd been scouted at uh, in roxborough and they told me that uh since you're going out there we'll have our uh, area scout take a look at you and i pitched well out there and uh it came back and they wanted me and signed me and drafted me quincy illinois your first stop uh, tell tell us about Quincy and uh, s- specifically the Midwest League, and then probably a ballpark a whole lot of people wouldn't uh, wouldn't think about uh, these days. No, Quincy was 
coincidence of one of those quaint little towns sitting up there on the Mississippi River and a lot of older people. In fact, I think the uh, percentage of older people was like uh, excuse me, over 65 was 50 or 60 percent. And the ballpark there was a, uh, that I was told was an old uh, uh, military Civil War uh, prison. And I, I believe it because there was a stone wall all the way around it. And the dressing rooms were underneath the stands that they'd built. And uh, that was a, a different sort of a place I, more than I had been used to. And then there'd be some nights where the, the fog would roll in off the river so thick you couldn't even see. In fact, one particular game we were playing, it started rolling in, and you couldn't see the center fielder from the dugout. And it, <laughs> but it was fun. I enjoyed playing up there for the one year. So I'm just wondering, um, you can't see the center fielder. How's the center fielder see a, a, a track of ball off the bat? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, kind of interesting. They they ended up calling the game. <laughs> they had to. <laughs> Nobody could see, and they didn't want anybody to get hurt. Earl, the Vietnam War was in progress, and you were in, drafted in the Army uh, later that year. Tell us a little bit about your time in the service, if you don't mind. Uh, not at all. I was I was doing really good with with uh, Quincy, and I don't. I think I probably did better than the Cubs expected I would do. And uh, they didn't worry about getting me in a, a National Guard unit or anything like that. And then I got my uh, my induction notice, and I gave it to them, and they said, well, we'll do what we can to, to see if we can get you in another unit. Because, like I said, I'd been pitching well, and mm -hmm. they liked it, <clears throat> what I had done. And they did. They got me one, but it was in Stockton, California, but no one knew that once you got your induction paper, you were done. You had to go. Oh, I'm sorry. You had to go. And so... I was uh, I put in for uh, a transfer my a draft my uh, drafting my uh, civil service uh, base was in in Smithfield so I put in transfer out to uh, Quincy and uh, they did that and then I I told uh, my my manager at the time, Harry Bright, that I'm, I'm, I said, I'm going home. Said, I got to go anyway, so I'm going home. I want to be spending the rest of the time with my parents. So I, I, I had my unit transferred back, mm -hmm. and that killed about 30 days I was able before I had to go. But I went to, then when I had to go, I went to basic training. After basic training, I went to California and came back to, to uh, jump school, and that's where I graduated from there in three weeks and came out to Fort Bragg and spent the rest of my time at Fort Bragg. And I know everybody was coming out of uh, jump school or out of basic training was going to Vietnam, but they had told us, we were wondering why we weren't going to Vietnam, and they told us that the uh, 173rd Airborne had got messed up pretty bad over in Vietnam and everything. They had to reinforce them, so... They took a unit of the 82nd, of actually a whole battalion, the 82nd to, to, to Vietnam to reinforce them. But the 82nd is the All-American Division for a reason. Mm -hmm. They have to be on call to go wherever they need it at any time. So everything coming out of jump school, we were the first uh, class that went to Fort Bragg. And I went to Fort Bragg and... That's where I stayed. In fact, my unit was trained in riot control, and we almost went to the riots in Detroit. We had been locked in the barracks. We had locked in the barracks, ready to go. And then they got it. The National Guard came in and quieted it down. And then they broke out in D.C. But then they got that taken care of. And after that, we, I just, uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> Rest of the time at Fort Bragg training. Tell me, Earl, this has never been one of my goals in life, but what's it like to jump out of an airplane? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was, uh, I enjoyed it. And you don't know, the first time you don't know what you're in for, so you just close your eyes and jump out the door. 
and the next time you know so you have a little fear factor mm -hmm. involved and but uh we jumped five times and i ended up jumping a total of 15 mm -hmm. to uh keep getting paid for it sure well your service ended um <clears throat> and a return to baseball in 1970 um underwent elbow surgery and one late one year later broke spring training with the cubs um, tell us a little bit about that spring and how you ended up in Chicago pretty quickly, honestly, for a, in, for a, uh, from a, from your minor league years of service. Yeah, I, uh, started having problems with my elbow in the, in the fall and they, and then I, I went out, I went to, back next year at, uh, Quincy and I went out. I remember, I will never forget it, not, not the date, but uh, we were playing Little Rock, Arkansas. And Al Herbrowski, remember that mm -hmm. name? The mad Hungarian? Absolutely. He was pitching. And I was pitching against him and doing pretty well. And I go out, we're at the bottom of 30, and we were hitting him pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I had like a 15, 20-minute wait sitting in the bullpen, mm -hmm. and my elbow just locked up. It didn't hurt just locked up and I went to the mound and went to warm up and threw the ball about uh, 40 feet out there wow and then it started hurting and I had to walk off and Harry Bright again was my my manager and, and he went right in and and called Chicago and uh they said well put him on the plane in the morning so I was on the plane the next morning went up and uh I will never forget this either. Went up and had the examination and everything, x-rays, and went in. And the doctor says, Earl, he says, what kind of uh, pitcher do you think you are or can be? I said, I think I can do pretty good, or really well. And he said, well, I got some news. Uh, you got a bone spur surrounded by calcium that has formed, and it's almost the size of a, a quarter on covering the bone spur. He said, we can take it out, and at most you might be a good minor league pitcher. And he says, now what do you want to do? I said, I want to get it out because I'd had it enough for a long period of time. And he says, okay, let me go talk to the boss. So he went in and talked to the front office, and they said, if that's what he wants, take it out. And he took it out. I went back to uh, I was on about two weeks of rehab, went back and joined uh, San Antonio the next uh, year and uh, threw a little bit trying to get back in shape, but I didn't. I, I never really did get in pitching shape. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, I went to uh, the instructional league and I was back and I was doing really well. And uh, then kept me on the roster and I went to spring training and I ended up pitching about 20, 20 to 25 innings and only give up a couple of runs and it was in between it was between me and another left-hander Ray Newman but uh I won that I won that and uh they took me to the big leagues and uh that's where I should have been a long time but I pitched about two months up there, and I just got the – for Leo DeRosa, bless his heart. <laughs> and uh, uh, they drafted Burt Hooten. I don't know if you remember that name, mm -hmm. Burt Hooten. He, he was coming out of Texas. They drafted him in their draft. And uh, he was uh, pretty good. They brought him to Chicago. And he threw on the side, and I thought uh, Leo DeRoche was going to lay an egg. He just loved him, just loved him. And so, therefore, they kept him and sent me back. And the sad, the bad thing is it really bothered me and still bothers me to this point was that Leo, he never said a word to me because he didn't like young guys. But he never said a word to me the whole time I was up there. He never come and told me, said, oh, we're sending you down. Mel Wright, who was the pitching coach, came and told me. 
He said, oh, we're going to send you back. We could, we're going to send you back to AAA. I said, I asked him, I said, Mel, why are you going to do that? He said, I'm doing all the, I told him, I said, I'm doing all the pitching up here, and I got the only win and the only save in the bullpen. He said, well, Earl, we want you to get more innings in. But I found out later on that Phil Reagan, if you remember Phil Reagan mm-hmm. and the Vulture, he was, they had picked him up in the winter, and he was on the staff. So he was their short man. And he didn't like it because he wasn't getting enough innings, and he started, you know, whatever it was. So somebody had to go. The bad thing was I went down and won my first four games. One of them was a one-hit shutout, and that didn't do a bit of good. They never called me back. And I ended up getting traded in Milwaukee. Earl, when you were in – with the Cubs, you played alongside future Hall of Famers, Billy Williams and Ron Santo. Tell me a little bit about those guys. What made them so special? They were just great guys, and they weren't the only two. There was uh, Fergie Jenkins, mm-hmm. Ernie Banks, <laughs> and, and they were just really good people on top of being really pretty good ball players. And Billy was kind of a quiet person. He didn't say much. He just went about his work, and, and he worked hard. And, and Ron, he was he was a little bubbly, outgoing sort of a character, but he was really a good person too. But none of them made a rookie feel like they were rookies. Mm-hmm. They, they accepted them for what they were. And probably my the best friend on the team was Fergie, and he was another guy that was just really an outstanding personality, really a good guy. And uh, and then when I made the club in spring training, Kenny Holtzman was sitting in a bar. He came up to me. And sat down. He said, "Oh, let's have a drink together." I said, "Okay, Kenny." He said, "I want you to know. I'm glad you made it." He said, "I'm with. Do you have any problems? You need to ask me anything. Don't feel, you know, like it's an obligation. Just ask me. So I'll help you do whatever I can." And I said, "I appreciate that, Kenny. Kenny was a good man too. I. But there was a lot of good players on that team, but." Uh, Ernie Banks, of course, Ernie Banks, he uh, he never forgot a face mm-hmm. and a name. And uh, you walk in the clubhouse, it's a good day to play two, great day mm-hmm. to play two, mm-hmm. always. Great day to play two. He loved to play baseball. Earl, having veteran players like that treat you the way they did, did that influence you going forward in your career? Did you, you know, because you were around right at the top levels. And there was young people coming through. Did that? How did that influence you going forward? Uh, it it uh, kind of humbled me a little bit. I was uh, kind of shocked and surprised at the older guys, and especially being guys that were uh, uh, at the time Hall of Fame caliber that were treating rookies like that. And not only me, just all the there was two or three other rookies on the team: Bill Bonham and Ray. Uh, couple other guys but they treat us all that way just made us feel at home and yes and it, it did help me a little bit to, uh, as I went along the new guys coming in try to you know help them left-handed pitching's always been a priority in professional baseball and by by the count you were involved in four trades over the next three years um, going to the brewers then the phillies expos and twins organizations tell us a little bit about that 1972 season in milwaukee where you really were a mainstay in the brewers bullpen that that i enjoyed that year and dave bristol was starting out when he was the manager and we didn't play well and he got fired, and Dale Crandall took over. And uh, it kind of – I didn't get as quite much work as I got with Dave there. And ended up that uh, at the end of the year that Dave was in, being talked about to be the Phillies manager at the time. And uh, He had already told – this is what I heard now I'm telling for a mm-hmm. second. He had already told uh, someone that he'd wanted certain guys, and mm-hmm. I'm being one of them. And I think Jim Lonborg and Kenny Brett and and Ken Sanders. I'm not sure there was four of us for three. 
and uh and I just, if he got the job, I'd go. To, I would be in the big leagues again. Mm -hmm. But he didn't get the job, and I had to go. And I went to spring training. In fact, well, they kept me on the roster. I went to spring training and did not get. I pitched four innings all spring training. Wow. Did not get an opportunity to make the club, mm -hmm. and I didn't understand that at all. And I was given no reason. And finally, I just. Went in and talked to, uh, I can't remember the general manager's name at the time. But he says, uh, he says, we got this guy, Mike Scarris. You might remember that name. He pitched a double A the year before, and mm -hmm. he came up at the end of the year and done well. He said, well, we got Mike Scarris pitching out of the bullpen, and he's he's done real well and uh, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And. We're just going to keep him and send you back to uh, Eugene. Mm -hmm. Earl, tell me about, uh, let's back it up to July 1972. Um, and you got the call to start against the Angels. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, and, and the guy across, the, uh, across the, the field from you in the Angels dugout, their starting pitcher was a guy that <laughs> most baseball fans know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether it was good luck or not, but anyway, it was Nolan Ryan. And, you know, I was the top guy. I didn't care who it was. I was going to do my best against you. And if it was Nolan Ryan, I was going to go out and give it everything I got. And I did, and I pitched a good ball game against him. And and he wasn't really on, but he was good enough to shut us out. I mean, we got eight hits off of him, and I think I give up five or something. I don't remember exactly. But – he beat me in the bottom of the ninth inning on a pinch hit single with one out. Actually, two outs. Get two outs because they sacrificed the button and made the two out. And and the guy that uh, pinch hit was the guy I had faced in Triple A. And I jammed him, and I jammed him bad. And he put one in his little what they call a little Texas league right mm -hmm. over the second base, and uh, they scored the winning run. Just one of those nights. Yeah, just one of those nights. But that was after he sat down and think about it. Man, Nolan Ryan just pitched a good game against him. And that's the season before the American League and the Brewers were in the AL at that time, adopted the DH. So you got to stand in several times against Nolan Ryan. What Ooh. was that like? Stand out. <laughs> that was something. First time up. Now, I, I love to hit as I did all. And I do not know, and I, he probably don't know why, but he, th he threw me a curveball. And he, he had a pretty good curveball, but I could hit a curveball. And it, he threw that curveball, and I pulled it in the dugout. Needless to say, <laughs> that was the last curveball. Here come the Express. And three times, three Ks, but I'll tell you what, I never looked at it. I was swinging every pitch. Is that the fastest pitcher you ever faced? The fastest I, fastest I have ever seen. Earl, along the way, who were some of the better pitching coaches that you worked with, and, and what did you learn from them? Well, the first one, as I mentioned earlier, was Fred Martin. He was an older guy. In fact, he probably – I don't think he went two or three more years. He showed me how to throw the two-seamer, and and he was just encouraging all the time, trying to build not just me but all the young guys up. And then the next one I really had was um, – uh, Ray Miller, who was a uh, manager for the Orioles. He was a good pitching coach. and But he it kind of disappointed me one night. I was pitching in Syracuse uh, with, the Red, with the Rochester Red Wings, and, and we, we had a doubleheader. And if we won both games, we'd clinch it. We, we were getting beat 10-2 in, in the bottom of the seventh or the top of the seventh inning. And uh, we came back and won the game. So we clinched the tie. But I had gone into the game and pitched. And I walked four guys in a row. I'd never done that before. But I walked four guys in a row. I never threw a ball above the knees. Mm -hmm. And Rabbit, his, his nickname was Rabbit. He came out. He said, oh, I don't know what to tell you, bud. But after I – Look back on it after working with all the kids all these years, and I look back on it, if he'd have just told me to throw a four-seam fastball, 
four seam fastballs don't move mm-hmm. like a two seam. Right. If I'd have thrown a four seam, I probably I wouldn't have walked four guys. Who knows? Right. But he was one. He was those two were the the best ones that I had. Earl, you spent nine years competing at the AAA and the big league level. What kept you going uh, those years when you thought you should have been in the majors and in, instead you were in Eugene or Tacoma? Oh, it was hard. But, you know, it just comes down to want to play baseball. Mm-hmm. And that just kept me going. And plus the fact that I played on three or four pretty good AAA teams. Mm-hmm. And that just made it a lot easier to, to deal with. And there was a couple of times where I'd been told, and in fact, the one time with Eugene, uh, I was pitching pretty well. Jim Lonborg was the manager, mm-hmm. if you remember Jim Lonborg. Mm-hmm. He was the manager there, and uh, I was pitching pretty well. And the, uh, one of the uh, scouts came down to look to see who they wanted to call up because I think they had an injury or something mm-hmm. on the pitching staff. And they went and when they left, went back to Philadelphia. And there's another left-hander on the team who was pitching pretty decent too, but he was a starter. And they called him up. Mm-hmm. His name was Mike Wallace. Mm-hmm. They called him up. And I said, Jim, what happened? He said, Earl. He said I tried to get it. And he said, but they just wanted Mike. He said I tried to I, I tried to get it for you. Talk to him, and he said, "Nah, we'll we'll take Mike Wallace." So, in '76, uh, you joined an organization that you followed as a kid, uh, in yep. Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And one season later, you're called up to the big club, playing for Earl Weaver, and alongside Brooks Robinson. Tell us about your time in Baltimore. Well, I, that's another uh, situation I really enjoyed too. I got called up, I think, the first time by the Orioles when Nellie Bryles got hurt. And I got called up for uh, the year, uh, not the year, but for the month. <clears throat> and that was another situation that came down, Stan, that it came down at the end of the month. They uh, Nellie was uh, about to come back on, and they had to send somebody out. And so there was another, there was an outfielder, and his name was Andres Mora. Mm-hmm. And me, it's between him and me. And they had a they had a coaches meeting. And Ray Miller again was pitching coach, mm-hmm. whatever it was then. Mm-hmm. And he told me, he said, I'll, I'll do what I can for you. And uh, I said, okay, Ray, that's all you can do. And he came back out. We were taking bat practice, and he came back out after the meeting. He said, oh, they decided to keep an extra outfielder. So you're going back to Triple A. I said, okay. Didn't really care for it, didn't understand it, but, you know, I also heard it was a, one of the uh, coaches on the team wanted to wanted an extra out. He thought they needed an extra outfielder more than a pitcher. Mm-hmm. But I'd always heard the more pitch you got, the better off you are. Right, <laughs> absolutely. So that's just one of those things. Tell us about Brooks Robinson. Uh, he just passed away here in the last year, yeah, and uh, that's a shame. What, tell me about um, about playing alongside Brooks. Brooks was one of the greatest individuals I've ever met playing the game, and uh, I just happened to be up there. Well, I was there that month that uh, he just happened to have his uh, last day Orioles mm-hmm. in Memorial Stadium, and that place was packed, and it, we were playing the Red Sox. And I took a picture with him. I don't know where I showed you that one or not. Mm-hmm. And he and I took a picture, and uh, he signed it for me. But it was no better, no better person than him. And needless to say, not a better third baseman. I don't care where he come from, or ever will be a better third baseman than Brooks. Earl, who's the toughest batter you ever faced? Rod Carew. Really? Yes. And why was that? Well, Rod was a left-handed hitter. Mm-hmm. He was a contact hitter, and he was hard to get out because anything close in the strike zone, whether he could hit it or not, he was going to foul it off mm-hmm. until he got his pitch. And he just – he was tough. I mean, I, and, I, and I had the opportunity to play with Rod in, in uh, winter ball. 
I think a year or two after that, and he was the manager, and I've never seen a better hitter than him down there. He he set out for a solid week, came back in a game and hit and went five for five and one of them a home run. One of those were home runs and it's just he was just a pure hitter. And he could bunt mm-hmm. because he could fly. And he got a lot of bunt base hits. And I faced some pretty good hitters, but Rod was the toughest one to get out. I think I know this answer to this question already because of what you've already said, but uh, what do you really think about the designated hitter? Shouldn't a pitcher bat or, or not? Well, <laughs> I think pitcher should hit. It's taken a lot away from the game, but it's helped a lot of players. And now they're going to it in the National League, so I don't, I don't think there's – I, I hated when they imposed it to start with. I didn't like it. But <laughs> it's one of those things. Absolutely. And then, a, you know, a player like Orlando Cepeda, who had her bad knees, was probably the first notable DH. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then some other players who've come along, like Edgar Martinez or others mm-hmm. who really didn't have a position, uh, extended their careers. Yeah. Um, uh, my personal opinion is that if you're going to go up there and throw a 95 mile an hour fastball underneath somebody's chin, you might need to be able to feel <laughs> feel yeah. that presence as well. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Earl, you mentioned Quis- Quincy is uh, not your favorite ballpark. What would have been your favorite ballpark you ever played in? Mm, I think about that one for a second or two. I like the uh, the AAA Stadium uh, in Rochester mm-hmm. because it was so enclosed and it was the people were right down. It was fan friendly, mm-hmm. and they got to know you. You got to know them, and I really liked that atmosphere that they had there. And I enjoyed playing there. I played there, I think, four or five years. I really enjoyed playing there because it was a good place to play baseball. Mm-hmm. But I, that was the one of the ones, as far as big league is concerned. Uh, I don't really have a uh, preference there. Now they're all like out of a cookie cutter. Mm-hmm. Back then they were – the Red Sox – the stadium there was good. The Yankee Stadium was a good place. Uh, now you wouldn't even know it, either or, because they've gone in and, and tore out the clubhouse and made them a lot bigger and a lot nicer. And then when the Red Sox Stadium, Fenway Park was cramped, and so was the old Yankee mm-hmm. Stadium. All the clubhouses were cramped and stuff. But hey, that was major leagues. You don't complain. Absolutely. <laughs> Earl, after your playing days ended, you stayed in the organization as a pitching coach. Um, did the Orioles have a certain way they wanted pitchers developed, or did you have individual plans for each one? What What did you learn um, and and from your your pitching days, and how did you translate it into instruction? Well, they didn't have a certain thing, and I I tried my best to, to do what I could to help the guys in any way, shape that I could, as far as throwing. And I've learned a lot since then about pitching and being able and working with kids and stuff. And and after getting out of professional baseball, I worked at Doyle Baseball School for three years, and I've learned a lot about pitching that I wish that I had known then. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the one thing, the one routine I really had was playing every day during the season was getting my start getting all my pitchers to do play long toss afterward e after but do it easy but before their next start and and keeping the uh the middle relievers or infield uh, short the relievers throwing so they would be sharp when we needed them mm-hmm. which once in the big leagues, you have to do it on your own. You have to tell the coach. Sometimes the coach said, well, you need to throw. You haven't thrown three or four days. And uh, But I tried to stay on top of that and try to keep them throwing, keep them sharp. Because I remember one time when I was with Milwaukee, I pitched against the White Sox. I called in, and, and I wasn't sharp at all. 
and I hadn't pitched in two weeks. And 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 being a sinker ball pitcher, if you're sharp and you're too strong, you try to overthrow, mm -hmm. and it doesn't help any. And I got aggravated about that, and and so I learned from that attitude about that. Earl, you literally traveled coast to coast through North, Central, and South America yes, in your playing career. After seeing all those places and, and living in all those different areas, what made you want to return to this area uh, after your playing days were over? Well, first of all, it's home and no place like home. <laughs> and I wanted to come back and maybe help develop some of these kids to, to have the opportunity to go where I've been. And that was the main thing. And that's still my goal in working with kids today. I still do pitching lessons. I'm doing them now. And uh, my, it's my main goal is to try to get the uh, kids to go where I've been, to experience that. It's, it's a great life, but it, it's not really the end of all. All is trying to get them to get a good education and, and to become young men to help them. Coaching, whether it's high school, legion, youth level, baseball players, um, is it different than coaching pros? How is it different? How's it the same? Well, it's the same in the fact that the techniques, the, the fundamentals, is the same. And you'd like for them to all have those uh, uh, mental <laughs> aspects of the game. But, mm -hmm. And that's what's good about the, the uh, younger kids. You teach them. You teach them. When my son and I, we got an, started an organization called Bulls Youth Baseball, and that's what we're really focusing on. We just got to start an 8U team, and we're going to start teaching them the fundamentals of fielding and throwing and hitting, which is big to start with because they don't pitch until they get about eight, 9 or 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But you would uh, – I guess the baseball IQ – it's the difference in, in anything. Sure. You get, uh, you'll get you get some kids that really want to play ball, will take time to learn the game and want to play the game and do it right. And uh, that's the biggest thing. What are some of your pieces of advice you give to the kids? Well, I always tell them. I said, if I hear somebody say can't, I stop right then. I said, can't's not in my dictionary. You can do anything you want to do. But you gotta want it. You gotta want it bad. And I give them the example of me graduating from a little small school in Benson, I think 60, 65, Benson there, and only been out of the, the state or out of the county twice to go to uh, being drafted and thrown into spring training in Scottsdale, Arizona, about as far away as you can get from home. Amongst all these players, they play baseball the year round. Mm -hmm. And the easiest thing for me to have done was to quit and come back. Mm -hmm. And But my mentality is uh, I'm just as good as you are. I don't care who you are. I, I've always had that attitude, and I try to instill that in kids. you gotta, you got to have that, especially in pitching. Like I said, in pitching, you see some of these guys walking up there, they've hit uh, – X number of home runs hitting about 350, 360, and, and just, you know, it's easy to get intimidated. Mm -hmm. About like the time when I faced uh, Frank Howard. Mm -hmm. Here comes, and he was an uh, uh, anomaly for that, uh, those years. 6'7, about 285. Now it's, uh, you got guys like that all everywhere. But with him, and he walks to the plate, and he's swinging old bed up there, and it looks like a toothpick. He already had a, a clubhouse meeting about pitching. How do you get guys out? Mm -hmm. And they're saying, well, don't throw in fastballs. I said, well, how am I going to – you know, I, my fastball is my best pitch. And, uh, okay. So I faced him, and I threw him a fastball, and he hit a, just a one-hop shot right at the third base. He was able to get it right here, chest high, throw him out at first. He come up to me afterwards. He said, oh, "Don't do that again." <laughs> <laughs> Earl, what about 
advice you give to parents? Uh, sometimes parents don't, don't let the kids have as much fun as they do. What, what, what's your best piece of advice to parents of young ball players? Well, it's, the parents are, are trying to play the game through their, their children, and they want them to be superstars. They, they think they're their next uh, major league ball player. And this, uh, you got to let them learn. You got to let them have all the fun they can. And just let them, don't, don't browbeat them to death because they made two or three errors in a game. That's going to happen. I've seen guys make three and four errors in a major league ball game, and they're still in there. And they go out there the next day, and they're still in there. But see, the parents don't look at it that way. My son can – the guy just made four errors yesterday. Well, today he may be perfect, and he might have made the win in play. You can't – can't look at it that way. Just because they made four don't mean your son has the opportunity to play. Your son needs to work harder maybe. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell them, make – they work harder and want to play and just let them be themselves. Earl, uh, you've been involved in baseball all of your adult life. What keeps you going to the ballpark or to the, to the uh, instruction fields and things like that? Got to love it, and I do love it. And, and to see some of these kids when they're doing well, I got two or three eight-year-olds right now, and it, uh, I tell the good Lord, I said, I'd just love to be long, alive long enough to see them make go as far as they'll go. And to see that the, the shine in their eyes and know that you're helping them get better and better and, and instilling in, in them that they got to work hard and in turn they work hard. And all the kids, I try to instill that in all of them. And even in the teams that I coach, I'm a, I'm a disciplinarian because that's the only way you're going to get better is you've got to listen and you've got to work hard if you're going to get better. Earl, later this month, you're going to be inducted into the Campbell Athletics Hall of Fame. What does that mean to you? Well, I can't even about to begin it. It's, uh, I still ain't digested it in. In fact, uh, that day that you and I were sitting out in the stadium out there talking about it and you hit me with that and I said, Oh my gosh. And I still, it's still, I still can't hardly believe it. But, you know, the way I feel about it is I'm really proud of it. We work hard as, as athletes. We don't look for rewards like this, rewards. But if they come, that's fine too. Finally, Earl, can you put into words how the game of baseball and this community have impacted your life? Well, in the last few years, the uh, the caliber players have gotten better, and I like to think I had a little something to do with some of those guys. And I've uh, I've had some help along the way, and I got my son Jeffrey is is really helped me, and he, and he keeps me going too. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a project in mind, and then we're trying to get it done, and and I'm trying to get it worked out for him, and and so, and he loves baseball just as much as I do, and uh, trying to get it worked out for him so he'll have something. To, to carry on the baseball name. Right. So we're working at it. <laughs> I'm Stan Cole, and our guest today on Tales from the Creek has been Earl Stevenson. Thank you, Earl, for sharing your Tales from the Creek. Thank you, Stan. It's been a privilege.